Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to our free paper session dedicated to a rapid response uh, system in cardiac arrest. Um, we are all uh, together, moderator and uh, the five speakers. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce um, our co-moderator, Dr. Kate Cooper. Please, Kate. Oh, good morning, everyone. And our co-moderator coming from uh, uh, Young Resuscitation Council, James, please. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So uh, we'll start. Um, we have um, five speakers coming from different parts of the world, from different system, and uh, five amazing uh, presentation uh, on this topic, a rapid uh, response system. And I will ask uh, Kate to introduce the first one. Please, Kate. So, so good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, the first presentation by Chin Yen Chu, who's an attending physician at the National Taiwan University Hospital and Emergency Department and a researcher at the National Taiwan University um, Institute of Clinical Medicine. Um, so we're now going to play his presentation, which is around deep learning and predicting in hospital cardiac arrest. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Yu Chu. It's an honor for me to talk about this topic. Experimental model of deep learning for outcomes prediction of in hospital cardiac arrest patients. Our study members include clinical physicians from National Taiwan University Hospital Emergency Department and data scientists from Notion Corporation. In Taiwan, the incident of Inca was around 23 events per thousand admission. The survival rate was around 14 and the favorable neurological rate was around 7. The deep learning has proved to outperform traditional method in predicting outcomes. However, it struggles with explainability and considered as a black box. So in this study, we use sharply addictive explanation analysis, which can provide some meaningful insights of deep learning model. In this study, we use Taiwan National Health Insurance Research Database, NHIRD, from 2002 to 2010. NHIRD have coverage of over 99.9 percentage of Taiwan's population. And the NHIRD contain over 1 million of random selected people from the database. In this study, we include all adult patients experienced in car in NHIRD. The outcome we choose 30 day mortality and 30 day readmission after in car event. Finally, the cohort included 169,287 in car events and split to three sections 70% in trend cohort, 15% in validation cohort, and 50% in test cohort. In NHIRD, there are several input features, including ICD codes, which represent diagnosis, procedures, medications, and tests. Other, demo other features, including like patient demographics, event status, and historical information. Before performing deep learning, test two nodes was used for embedding textual features into factors. And the clinical input factors then generate event encoder for each individual event. The event encoder then also used as a new factor for recurrent neural network and updates personal event prediction. But the deep learning network can only 
generate model prediction. So in this study, we use sharp analysis, which can generate the output of machine learning model and give the explanation. And here's the results. Model show that when try to predict 30-day mortality, the model plays strong emphasis on medication codes, diagnosis codes, test codes, and procedure codes. When try to predict 30-day readmission, the model plays strong emphasis on hospital state, medication code, total codes, and procedure codes. In conclusion, in this study, we can find that sharp analysis can provide some reasonable and meaningful explanation of deep learning model. Our study group will further perform a gener to a generate explanation on medical code level and let the learning model more useful and applicable in clinical setting. Thank you very much. So, so thank you very much for that, that excellent presentation and that excellent summary of, of what it is some incredible work and, and real use of some um, innovative technology. Um, so um, I, I'm going to kick off and now I would encourage everyone to pl please put your questions on the Slido um, so we, we can see them. Um, and what we plan to do over the, the course of the five speaks is probably to have perhaps two or three questions after each speaker and then if we've got time at the end we'll bring everything together and perhaps ask some the speakers to comment on some more general issues that, that may come up. Um, so, so, in your two, um, so one thing I wasn't clear about is, is how well did your model perform? So, so for not normally we'd expect to see some sort of um, ind indicator or some measure of, of how well the model performs. I, I didn't spot that and I was just wondering if you could tell me and this may be my ignorance of how machine learning works uh so uh, you means uh, how the uh, technologist the data scientists do our database to machine right no so i meant how good is it at predicting um 30-day mortality oh the the, the a on the curve is is around 0 0.8 around is the but there's uh, uh, several models, the uh, AROC is around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 because uh, we face a problem with the, the survival of the uh, incarnation uh, is very few. So the, the, date, the number of the patients we are interested compared with the general population uh, is very few. And so we use something like uh, the resampling or the weighting of our patient. So there are several uh, models we constructed. And so the error is from a, a 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. And then we do the, the external model to help us to uh, find out what is the, the important factor. But uh, I think this is only a, a pre preliminary report. So we will further to divide the the explain model to uh, more detail and like now there's only medication code so the other part we are going to the uh, medication what kind of medication or what kind of diagnosis and so it's the work is still ongoing maybe later we will more report from the from this this study okay um and, and trees um has um, asked a question because um, I think we're all jealous of the size of your data set. Um, so how big a data set does, does someone need to be able to do these kind of techniques? So I think you had 170,000 um, patients. Uh, how, I, I think that's the uh, data set we, we use from the, the NHRD and try to try to perform the, the calculation and the uh, Deep learning analysis. So I'm not sure the, how big it is uh, good enough, but uh, we just try it on this database. Okay, so, so Therese has some work to do to increase the size of our data set maybe. Um, 
and, and then another question that's been um, asked, um, which I think will be the final one before we move on to the next speaker is, um, do you think this model can be applied um, to identify patients at higher risk of in-hospital cardiac arrest and admission um, to hospital? And, and then could we perhaps use that information to help us with advanced care planning? Uh, actually, uh, we identified the, the, the in-hospital cardiac arrest patient uh, after if they got ROC, return of response tennis circulation and find maybe if they will get the mortality or readmission after they discharge from our hospital. So this is not like in previous uh, track and trigger system like we find patient who are going to have cardiac arrest in hospital. We use this system to find who will have a higher risk after they going home. So that's the, uh, the new idea of our study. So maybe that's not for the patient uh, having cardiac arrest, that's for the patient having cardiac, having high risk after cardiac arrest. No, sorry, I can, there I can are quite a few more questions appearing on Slido, so, so please, if you can, have a look at those and perhaps answer them on Slido um, by looking directly at it. Um, one of the sad things about a virtual conference is we can't then give you a round of applause at the end of what's been an excellent presentation. Uh, but thank you very much, and that's been a really impressive piece of work. Thank you very much, and that's been a really impressive piece of work. Thank you very much, and that's been a really impressive piece of work. Thank you. Yeah, that's been a really impressive I'm, I'm going to hand over now to James, who's going to present the next speaker. Thanks, Keith. Um, so for our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Crystal Graham. Um, Crystal is a final year medical student in Adens University in southern Denmark, uh, and she presents her thesis project uh, investigating the accuracy of telephone dispatches um, in identifying out-of-hospital cardiac arrest after the introduction of a new telephone CPR algorithm. We'll play her video first and then there'll be some questions. Hi, my name is Crystal. I'm studying medicine at Odense University in Denmark and this is my final master's thesis. The project is called Assessment of an Intervention to Improve Telephone Dispatches Accuracy in Identifying Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest. In 2018, the Resuscitation Academy published 10 steps for improving survival from sudden cardiac arrest. These recommendations include telephone CPR performance standards published in 2017 from the American Heart Association. The Emergency Medical Dispatch Center in the region of southern Denmark has adopted the recommendations of Resuscitation Academy. Thus, this study aimed to evaluate and compare the accuracy in recognizing out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by medical dispatchers in southern Denmark before and after implementing the telephone CPR recommendations and performance goals as outlined by Resuscitation Academy. We initiated the training program recommended by Resuscitation Academy with slight modifications. All dispatchers were subject to supplemental education concerning out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and the conduction of telephone CPR. Simultaneously, an auditing process was started with randomly chosen cardiac arrest calls from each dispatcher were evaluated with the use of a data collection form inspired from the one recommended by Resuscitation Academy. The result from the data collection form was summarized and used for feedback to the dispatcher and for internal quality control. Furthermore, we made a compulsory algorithm tool based on the no-no-go algorithm including two basic questions. Is the patient conscious and is the patient breathing normally? If the answer to both is no, the dispatcher immediately begins instruction in telephone CPR. The intention was to force the dispatcher to consider a potential cardiac arrest in all calls. This study included calls from two times three months. The baseline period included all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in southern Denmark in December 2017 to February 2018 and the post-intervention period included calls from December 2019 to February 2020. This gave a total of 673 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest calls from the two study periods. 
Of those, 256 were excluded due to exclusion criteria proposed by Resuscitation Academy. The exclusion criteria included things such as third-party calls, CPR already in progress, and communication problems. The performance goals outlined by Resuscitation Academy and, and the American Heart Association included a median time between contact with a caller and recognition of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by the dispatcher of under 120 seconds. The maximum acceptable time that may elapse from contact with the caller and until the first compression is administered is set to 180 seconds. Furthermore, the goal was to correctly identify at least 95% of all out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest cases. This table shows our findings. Of 209 included cardiac arrest calls in the pre-intervention period, 37 cardiac arrest calls were unrecognized by the dispatcher, giving a sensitivity for identifying out-of-hospital cardiac arrest at 82.3%. Of 208 included cardiac arrest calls following the intervention, 15 went unrecognized, giving a sensitivity for identifying out-of-hospital uh, out cardiac arrest calls at 92.7%. This proved a significant improvement, but the performance goal aiming at 95% correctly identified cases were not quite met. Consciousness at briefing were addressed in general and no significant difference between median time in the two periods were found. Furthermore, the median time to recognize cardiac and wrist and to the first compression were given at the scene showed no significant improvement despite a reduction of duration from 68 to 56 seconds in recognizing out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by the dispatcher. Perhaps a greater study period could prove this tendency of improvement. To further optimize the effectiveness of out-of-hospital resuscitation, new technologies keep changing the time limitation in the change of survival, but the dispatcher will continue to be a key element in the emergency medical dispatch center and continuous quality improvement of the dispatcher's performance should include education and ongoing quality assessment of the voice looks. Adjustments could, however, be the key to a more effective evaluation. For example, self-audit could enhance the dispatcher's ability to reflect on own practice and thereby become aware of irrelevant questioning and self-adjust to more effective diagnostic capabilities. Furthermore, we are going to implement low-dose, high-frequency simulation training to keep practical learning abreast with theoretical education. In many constellations, this concept has been shown to be an effective approach to teaching as repetitive interventions result in better learning out outcomes. Thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Crystal, for a great presentation. Um, I found that really interesting to watch and I thought it was presented really clearly and, e and easy to follow as well. Um, so I'd like to invite anyone in the audience who's got some questions, and I can see there's some starting to come through already, um, to post and we'll ask Crystal some questions now, if you can unmute your microphone, Crystal. Um, and I'm going to start with a question, if that's okay. Um, so looking at your um, data, I was really interested that actually there weren't that many cases of misdiagnosed cardiac arrest, which I thought there would be. Um, but in the group where cardiac arrest was missed, um, when was it? typically picked up, do you know, was that later in the phone call or was it not until EMS arrived on scene? Uh, the group where the cardiac arrest wasn't acknowledged. Um, well, that was only picked up uh, when the patient came to the hospital, uh, when the ambulance arrived and they could um, uh, confirm that in the locks. Um, not before that. Okay. Um, and then our next question. So Chris has asked a question um, and he says, uh, do you have any insight into the reasons um, why, uh, and it's a similar thing. So any insight into the reasons why those cardiac arrests weren't picked up? Yes, I think maybe the reason could be that the compulsory algorithm with the no, no, go questions weren't used systematically. Uh, despite we made this a mandatory pop-up visitation algorithm on the dispatcher's computer, which they were advised to use in every emergency medical call. Um, I think they have been um, 
it, yeah, there's a lot of other calls than out of hospital cardiac arrest calls and you have to suspicious uh, cardiac arrest in every call to to ask those questions and maybe that wasn't that hadn't been done um, continuously i suppose the uh, i don't know in uh, we have an analogy of the needle in the haystack and it's trying to find the needle yeah, in the haystack exactly. that's the challenge yeah, yeah. Um, so i'm just going to see if we have any other questions um so janet says um did you look at any patients not in out of hospital cardiac arrest and did any of these receive CPR? Yes, um, every, I looked at all the cases where the medical dispatchers uh, suspected an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and there were some I think in, um, in, the pre, in the study period before the intervention there were actually two cases where the, the dispatchers suspected cardiac arrest and there were actually not a cardiac arrest. Um, yeah. Not I think... Was that the question or? Yeah, I think that was. And I think there's another question that you've answered there as well. Um, I had another question, which is you said 92% um, was the rate you'd got to and 95% was the target. So do you have any ideas on how the system could be improved further to try and increase the accuracy of cardiac arrest diagnosis? Yeah, we are going to try to make more self-evaluation of the dispatcher so that they have to listen to their own cardiac risk calls to maybe acknowledge some of the mistakes they do and some of the irrelevant questioning they, they may be asking about. Um, um, is it a girl or boy? How old is she? That's irrelevant questioning when you know there is a cardiac arrest. So yeah, we and and we hope to optimize that the dispatcher uses the no no go questions as is the patient briefing or uh, is the patient conscious because that should uh, be enough to um, suspect cardiac arrest. Okay, thanks very much for a great presentation again. Um, do keep the questions coming because we might come back to the end, but I'm going to pass over to Diana now to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, James. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alonso Mateos Rodriguez coming from um, Madrid, Spain. Um, he's an um, emergency physician in emergency medical service 112 in Madrid. And also uh, he's officer inside the transplant program in Madrid. And um, um, paper will refer to long-term evolution of kidney graft, uh, graft donation. Please, Alonso. Hello, how are you? I am Alonso Mateo from the Regional Office of Coordinate and Transplant Coordination. We would like to present this investigation about long-term evolution of kidney graft donation procedures in uncontrolled donor after cardiac death in the community of Madrid. As you know, Madrid is the, the first region in the world in, in start the, the, the procedure of uh, uncontrolled donor after cardiac death. But in the last years, uh, we have a, a decrease of the number of these donors. One of the possible reasons is the lower efficiency of the organs, but we would like to, to, to compare the survival rate uh, of this donor with other types of donor. For this, we have a very good uh, tool that is the Madre Registry of Renal, renal Patients. The registry is uh, called the Evolution of Kidney Transplant and Kidney Disease signs its creation in 2028. For the data analysis, we use the Kaplan Major test. This is the results in the first image. You can see the, um, the living donors. In this one, the living donor, the brain death donors, UDCD, and controlled DCD donors. Uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, UDCD at 
20 years have a good survivor. The first one is liver donor, but it's the third one. In this compare, you can see the compared in survival to 10 years between B, BDB and UDCD. And it's very interesting to know that uh, in the middle of the of the registry of five years uh, is more the is mm, the same survival between this type of donors. In the third one, you can see the compare between control DCD and uncontrol DCD. In Spain, we start the control DCD five years, uh, six years ago, and then we have only this uh, this year of history, and the uh, the survival is very similar. Then we can conclude that the immediate survival of uh, UDCD is somewhat lower at the other type of donors, but at the no 10, five years, there, there is a concordance. And this is a very good survival with the, for this type of donors. Nothing else. Thank you very much for your attention. Here is uh, my email if you have any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alonso. Thank you. Uh, we are waiting for a question inside the Q&A um, frame. And I have one regarding uh, your um, experience that is impressive in, uh, in this uh, very special um, part of uh, recitation. Um, it's about uh, your experience, it is referred for this uh, paper only to kidney graft. But also, do you have experience for liver donation yes. of the dead person? Yes, for liver and from lung, uh, but the liver have got uh, very good, uh, very good results in UDCD. Uh, I don't know it's uh, when when we are uh, expect uh, from the start of the session. I was thinking that uh, I have to to put one slide about the procedure. I don't know if if all of you have uh, how is the procedure when when we are when we arrive to a carrier arrest. We start the the CPR. And if 20 minutes we haven't got any any rocks or 20 or 25, what, what we, we decide. Then we can go with the with the patient to only two hospitals in Madrid at Clinico and Tofer October. And then we can recover, uh, we can transplant kidney, liver, and lungs. So uh, tissue eyes and, and, and bone. But uh, the king of this plant transplant is the kidney. It's the, the first, uh, the first uh, organ that uh, we transplant with this, with this process. With, with this process. And it is the, the, the um, organ that has the better results. The second one is the lung. The lung is very good results because uh, it's a very young person under 60 years old. And they haven't got uh, the, the damage of uh, a lot of days in UC intensive care units. But the, with the liver, we have problems. Uh, perhaps it's the, the word the word organ to, to, to recover from, from uncontrolled uh, donor of the cardiac death. Okay. And another question is about the proportion of the patient don't proceed to donation because transplant surgeon, maybe, or somebody else from the team decides that organ is not viable. And if it's similar between the two procedure, uh, DBD and uh, DCD. Yeah, but the first the first thing that you have to to do when you can uh, when you you want to start this program uh, is to speak with the legal agency with the youth and the and the with the legal system and second with the surgeon uh, here in Madrid uh, we start this year this bad year to start the CDC, no, the UDCD, the control donor in, in child, in children. 
And the first problem was uh, that the surgeon uh, don't, don't believe about the, the donor being a systole donor, donor after cardiac death. But he changed and, and he, he started only very, very few cases. But uh, as you say, the, the first thing that you can say you can do is to speak with the surgeon because the surgeon uh, have to, to recognize that this organ is possible to transplant. Okay, very interesting. So another question come, uh, it's a last one for the, this moment and maybe we'll uh, come at the end. Uh, what can other countries learn from this study? And uh, what is your opinion about um, informed consent in, in this situation? The uh, we have to, we have a lot of, uh, no problem, but uh, speak about this because all the friends and uh, all the doctor and nurse that uh, worry in SUMA 112 and other emergency system that have the same program uh, have uh, some question about how to communicate to the family uh, that we are going to, to carry out to, to take the patient to a hospital only for transplant, not for, for survive. Then uh, we have a, a guide uh, that we, 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 we have how to communicate the family, this one. Here in Spain, that's, I think that you know, we have a, I don't know how to say in English, but it's the a consent, present consent that all the people are donors. Uh, maybe you have to say to the family that uh, you don't know, you, you, you don't have to, to be donors. Uh, then, we haven't got any problem, so much problem with this. We, we are very transparent. Um, we explain to the family all the, the steps that we are doing in this moment. Uh, this, we have a, a variable, an item to, to measure this and this, uh, how, how, how much uh, negative families we have to add on now we are in, in 12% of, of family uh, negation, family negation of donation. That is a very good number. Okay, so the legislation is in favor of this uh, program. Thank you very much, Alonso. Very interesting and very useful for the other uh, countries. Thank so you very much. I will ask, uh, I will invite my co-moderator to continue with the next, next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so our fourth speaker this morning is Astrid Crack. Uh, Astrid is a cardiovascular nurse and PhD student at Copenhagen EMS. Um, I've had a sneak preview of her talk and it's really interesting and really excited to, to show it this morning. Um, and she's going to present her work investigating the impact of out of hospital cardiac arrest on bystander responders. Hi, my name is Astrid. I'm a nurse and a PhD student at the Copenhagen EMS. I will be speaking to you about the psychological aspects of activating citizen responders in case of a cardiac arrest. This study was funded by the Danish foundation Trykfonden. Citizen responder programs are increasingly implemented in several countries. However, very little is known about the psychological consequences for the volunteer responders dispatched to assist in resuscitation. Previous research on lay bystanders' experiences with ARCA report that bystanders need psychological preparedness and personal courage to overcome fear when acting in case of a cardiac arrest situation. Further, bystanders report psychological symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder such as lack of sleep, nightmares, and flashbacks. So why is this study important? Participating in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is a stressful situation, and it's not without psychological risk. The psychological risks of activating volunteer citizen responders in case of a cardiac arrest situation have been understudied despite worldwide implementation of citizen responder programs. 
Our aim was to evaluate citizen responders' degree of short-term psychological impact after being dispatched to an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest through the Danish smartphone application Heartrunner. In Denmark, when a cardiac arrest is suspected, the emergency dispatch center activates citizen responders to perform CPR and retrieve the nearest accessible AED. All dispatch citizen responders receive a follow-up questionnaire 90 minutes after the alarm. The questionnaire includes a self-rating of short-term perceived psychological impact on a scale from 1 to 5. In 1,418 cases of presumed cardiac arrest, 7,153 dispatch citizen responders accepted an alarm and 5,409 citizen responders completed the questionnaire. 1.4% of the citizen responders reported severe psychological impact. 5.4% reported moderate psychological impact. 24.5% reported low psychological impact. 68.6% .6 reported no psychological impact. Factors associated with severe psychological impact were age under 30 years, female sex, arrival prior to the ambulance, and use of an AED. In conclusion, very few citizen responders reported severe psychological impact following activation as citizen responder to an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Arrival prior to the ambulance, hands-on involvement, female sex and young age seem to predispose to more severe psychological impact. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Astrid. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Um, please do keep sending your questions on the Slido. Um, we have had a few uh, issues with the Slido, but it seems to be working now. So do keep sending your, your questions. Um, so the first question here um, says, the response rate um, is high, uh, 75%. Um, I think citizen responders are cooperative. Do you have any tips to get the high rate of response? Because I noticed you had um, 7,000 citizen responders to, to about 1,400 arrests. So any advice on how, how you got such this high rate? Astrid. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So in Denmark, um, we approach every citizen responders who do not respond to our questionnaire. So we approach them by a text message and by telephone calls. So if they do not respond, we uh, try to get uh, them to fill out the questionnaire by uh, access of them in any kind of way. And, and among those people who don't respond, are there any particular themes about why they might not do that? Yeah, most of them uh, do not respond because they didn't reach the cardiac arrest location. So if they did not uh, go for the mission, maybe because they were home with their kid or something like that, uh, they tend to not respond to the questionnaire. So most of them, uh, the non-responders, are uh, citizen responders who did not arrive at the cardiac arrest location. So there's a question from Rudolf, um, which says, how can you have, um, so you obviously evaluated the psychological impact um, a short while after the incident. Um, have you done any work to evaluate the psychological impact later on because things might take some time to emerge? Yeah, so uh, every citizen responder uh, gets the opportunity of a debriefing after their mission uh, by a healthcare personnel. And um, we haven't uh, yet uh, investigated the long-term psychological impact but we are um, we are actually doing that right now, so we will uh, soon be providing results for the uh, long term psychological distress as well. Brilliant, and I think you've answered another question there from um, Ian asking about what support is offered. Um, 
David says um, that they use the same system in Sweden and interestingly, they've had a similar high response rate. So volunteers are obviously keen to participate in, in this research after they've attended a cardiac arrest. Um, I have a question, which is, um, I suppose, more of an ethical one, um, because we're seeing a lot of these platforms now being developed. Whose responsibility do you think it is to provide support to citizen responders um, if they are dispatched by an app to a cardiac arrest? I think the host of the citizen responder program uh, should offer the citizen responder some kind of follow up. So as we do in Denmark, we reach out to every citizen responder who uh, reports severe psychological impact and we, we reach out to them uh, 24 to 72 hours after their mission by telephone in order to offer them debriefing. And I think that's very important uh, in order to ensure uh, that citizen responders are uh, feeling okay after uh, ambition. And, and just in the interest of time, there's loads of questions, but one more if that's okay. Um, so who were the citizen responders? Um, and somebody has asked, were there any differences between layperson responders and off-duty uh, healthcare professionals, for example? Who might be responding and whether they were more likely to experience um, short-term psychological impact. Mm. So the young citizen responders were more li likely to uh, report severe psychological impact and uh, citizen responders with a professional healthcare background uh, seem to be uh, less uh, affected by their um, personal experience. So there are some associations between age and professional background and previous experiences. Thank you very much. It's a really interesting subject area and it will be interesting to see how your work in this area develops further. Um, I'm going to pass over to Keith now, who's going to introduce our final speaker. So thank you, James. And um, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce Chris Smith. Um, Chris Smith is our, our final presenter today. Um, he's an emergency medicine doctor in the West Midlands um, in the UK, um, currently has taken a PhD at the University of Warwick, um, office is over the corridor from me, um, and he's going to be talking about um, detecting, um, identifying distances to AEDs and, and the optimal way to do that. So over to Chris's presentation. Hello, my name is Dr. Christopher Smith, and I'm going to talk to you about the potential for bystander defibrillation for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the moment who's funded by the National Institute for Health Research in the UK, and this is their disclaimer. And as part of my PhD, I am investigating the, the Good Sam Volunteer First Responder System, and I'm looked after by the good folks over at Warwick Clinical Trials Unit. So this chap's had a cardiac arrest. Fortunately, perhaps, uh, it's happened in public. It's happened where there are people available and willing to do CPR, and someone's retrieved a public access AED, uh, and it looks like they're about to give him a shock. But we know that doesn't really happen very often in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So I wanted to determine the proximity of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests uh, to public access AEDs using data from two ambulance service regions in the UK, London and the East Midlands. So using the ARC GIS mapping software, I was able to map the locations of cardiac arrests from a 12-month period in both ambulance services. And those are the blue dots on your screen. I was also able to map the location of uh, AEDs known to each service. Those are the red dots. And then for each cardiac arrest, um, I was able to determine a straight line distance to its nearest AED. By overlapping a, a transport network, I was also able to determine the, the real world travel distance using roads and paths from each cardiac arrest to its nearest AED. And so this is it represented visually. So uh, cardiac arrest number one, that's the blue dot in the bottom left corner, uh, by straight line distance is nearest to AED number one. But if we work out the, the, 
the uh, the road or the path that you'd have to take, the nearest AD, is further away. And it is, in fact, this time, AD number three. So using real-world estimates um, decreases your AD coverage in both London and the East Midlands. So that's uh, when you're looking at AEDs within 500 metres of an incident, um, there are more than 20% fewer AEDs available using real-world estimates in both areas. And the identity of the nearest AED changes in a quarter of cases for both London and the East Midlands, with the median travel distance uh, going up by more than 200 metres. So there and back, that would be more than 400 metres, which is more than four minutes extra retrieval time uh, at a reasonably fast walking pace of 100 metres per minute. So real-world travel estimates rather than straight line estimates, they reduce your AED coverage and they often change the identity of your nearest AED. And this has huge implications for any EMS system or dispatch system um, that sends bystanders from a cardiac arrest scene to retrieve an AED. You should be using real-world estimates. So just for me to say thank you to my co-authors uh, on this piece of work, so Professors Perkins and Ranjit Lal from the University of Warwick, Dr Rachel Fodergill from London Ambulance Service, and Mr Rob Speight from East Midlands Ambulance Service. And I'm available to take questions. So thank you very much, Chris, for that um, excellent presentation. I'm going to turn my video back on because I was sat on your head for some of that presentation. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I'm going to start with a question that builds slightly on what Janet, uh, Janet Bray has already asked. But um, one of the issues here really is that we're using distance as a proxy for, for time, aren't we? Um, so how do we, the ideal um, situation would presumably be to identify the nearest AED based on time, which may be linked to how fit the person is or what the roads are like or whether they've got a back or not. So is there any way to do that? Um, yes, we, we, we hadn't, you're right. This, the analysis I presented is based on, on, on walking distance. At the time that I did the analysis, I think we expected that um, most people would be would be going for, for AEDs um, on foot. Uh, interestingly, certainly within sort of volunteer first responder systems, subsequently got data that suggests that more people than we expected do go by bike or by or by motor vehicle. Um, so, so there is a there is a way in the mapping software to factor in traffic and um, and illegal turns and things like that. But I haven't done that for this analysis. It's purely based on a walk, a fast walking estimate. And is it? Just to put a little bit more to Janet Bray's question, so, so is there also a way then to, to build in time of day, for example, where traffic might be different? At different times yeah, if, if, you've, if you've got the right network model, um, mapping software can, um, uh, can can do that for you. Um, sh obviously, shouldn't shouldn't be too much of an issue for for the walker or for the runner, but, but for people who are thinking about jumping in the vehicle. Um, then yeah, the mapping software does allow you to do that. It's um, more, yeah, I, I would suggest that you need uh, an expert uh, GIS user to be able to do that, uh, but it is possible. Okay, and we've had a, a couple of questions along a similar theme from both David um, Fredman and Caitlin Timpower around, yeah. no, sorry, Terry Brown and David Fredman around, do you consider the accessibility of AEDs um, at the time of the collapse? Yeah, um, I, we didn't have information on availability hours of, of the AEDs. Um, interestingly, I know London, London Ambulance Service take the approach that they don't um, always consider a, a, a availability because uh, they, they've often found that AEDs that shouldn't be accessible um, out of hours, occasionally they find that they are. So I think the, um, one, one thought is that if you've got enough people um, send somebody to an AED, uh, even if it's not entirely clear whether it's accessible, uh, just, uh, just in case you're able to retrieve it. If you've got more than one person, you can potentially send one person to one AED and another person to a, to a second AED. Um, but yeah, no, but the short answer is I didn't have, have the information from the ambulance services about accessibility out of hours. Um, 
and James and Janet, James Nicholson and Janet Bray have answered questions along, along a similar theme around pointing out that EDs are mm. often um, placed non strategically by independent organisations. And, and Janet has flagged that 100%, 100 metres is often recommended as the optimum distance. So, how, how well are we doing at um, strategically locating AEDs and is there a way to improve that? Uh, th there, there is. I mean, it, you, you have little, I suppose you have little influence on, on private organisations. If somebody's fundraised to, to buy money for an AED, then um, it's very difficult to tell them to put it somewhere that they don't want. Um, I know Terry Brown, who's made one of the questions, he's actually doing work at the moment on uh, optimising placement of AEDs in the UK based on things like historical uh, incidents of cardiac arrest, uh, ambulance response times, um, population density and things like that. So that, that work is ongoing uh, and that's you know, where, where we have control over AD placement, so through central government or through ambulance services. Um, once that work is available, it will be shared with them to try and optimise placement in the future. And um, are ambulance services either in the UK or elsewhere um, using real world distances or are they using straight line distances? And are they going um, to change in your work? Yeah, well, world, worldwide, worldwide, I don't know. To be perfectly honest, the 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 system for AD dispatch in the UK is in its infancy, um, and I, I hope it would be greatly improved um, by the introduction of a of a national AD database, um, which has sort of come online in, in the last year or so. Um, so when these systems are developed, um, then I think the, the recommendation should be to use. Um, say real world travel travel distances um, it, it's not done as far as I'm aware it's not done particularly systematically so far in the UK and I don't know what the situation is in the rest of the world um, another question that's come through is, is does the app send citizens simultaneously to the patient and the AED short answer no um, it, it leaves the decision up to the responder uh, if there is an AED um, in a nearby uh, location, uh, then that is displayed on the screen. But um, good, um, we don't quite have the number of responders uh, available to us um, in the UK uh, for whatever reason that we do in other countries. So the number of alerts where there are multiple responders attending is actually very low. Um, so the opportunity to send one to the patient and one to, for an AD um, just doesn't just doesn't exist at the moment um, and some, some of the work we need to do um, is to just increase the number of people on, on the platform. Um, another question is um, how many were within 100 metres of the AD? Um, I can't remember I think it was one on one of the slides um, it's single it's single figure it's single uh, it's single figures I'm sure it's I'm sure it was in uh, on, on the table, Janet, so I, I don't have the figures to hand, but it's it's certainly fewer than, than 10% um, um, by, by, either, by either method. Um, and I think the comment was 100 metres is, is recommended. I know some, some systems use 100, some use 500. Um, I'm not aware that there's been any sort of detailed work on what the optimum response distance is for, for an AD. And as people have already commented, I suspect that depends on um, travel modality uh, as well as as well as distance. So, um, I'm not sure if there's any more questions coming through. Um, Astrid has pointed out on the chat that they're currently looking at long-term psychological impact on system response and going to publish their results um, hopefully soon, uh, which would be fantastic. Um, so. Uh, just to come back, I, I think, and perhaps um, bring in our first speaker here, it is um, machine learning <clears throat> potentially offers an opportunity to um, optimise our, our strategy for responding um, to um, sending people to get arrest through apps and things by potentially identifying people that are most likely to respond um, or perhaps identifying time of day and, and then um, doing things like that. So, so um, I was just wondering, um, 
whether our first speaker, Chien, wanted and you just wanted to um, think about or, or tell us about perhaps some of the ways we might be able to use machine learning for, for these type of things. I may have put him on the spot now because it had no relationship to his original presentation. But do you have any insight into how we might use machine learning more broadly for these other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, machine learning is an uh, advanced statistic uh, method. I think it's still with the, uh, from a big uh, data and do the analysis to find out some solution. Uh, I think it's not only can use in uh, inpatients or, or ICU patients, I think also can use in uh, OCA patients or something like that. So maybe there is, there is a, a big data to analysis. I think, I think the machine learning have the great role to find something interesting from the database, I think. Okay, and, and Freddie, just in case anyone's missed it, um, Freddie Lippert did a phenomenal presentation yesterday around machine learning to support um, identification of OCA by um, dispatchers to, to then prompt the phone CPR. Um, Chris has added a comment here around, um, coming back to the question around 100 metres, 80% um, of the hospital cardiac arrest of AED uh, within 100 metres. Um, because we've got a little bit of time, we've got some, we've got four minutes left. Um, Chika has just put in a question for Crystal. So if Crystal wants to come back in. Um, what communication skills do you think dispatchers should acquire um, Um, in terms of, of helping to support that process and talking to the citizen to support them? It, about the communication? The, of yeah, the... The communication skills, the dispatcher, well, what, what do you think they need to optimise that um, recognition process? I think they have to acknowledge that they have to consider a potential cardiac arrest in all calls and I think it, it may they think that it may seem to be uh, unpersonal to ask questions about consciousness if it seems obvious that the patient is conscious but it's clearly that some of the um, unrecognized out-of-hospital cardiac risks is on the background of that that they don't ask these questions and even though it may seem uh, unpersonal or unrelevant um, I think it's very important that they that they always ask the questions about consciousness and briefing at the end of the the conversation with the patient or the caller. Um, and um, I think the final question before we close the session goes to Astrid. And, and do responders get feedback on what happens to the patient in terms of outcome when they're dispatched via the app platform? Yeah, so we are not able to uh, give information about the patient's outcome for the citizen respondents, if that was the question. Yes, so, so yes, that was perfect. Thank you for clarifying. That. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we've come to the end of our allotted time, and I, I think this is now a fantastic opportunity to, um, first of all, thank my co-moderators, Diana and James, but most of all to, to thank... Um, the speakers who've done some uh, five phenomenal presentations um, around different aspects of, of rapid response systems. Um, so, so, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Chen Yu, um, Crystal, uh, Alonzo, uh, Mateus, um, Astrid and, and Chris, and to give them a virtual round of applause for some excellent presentations and, and some phenomenal um, responses to the questions and, and the, the excellent questions asked by the audience. So. Thank you very much, and, and I hope you have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.